I'm Bob Costa. I'm a national political reporter here at the Washington Post. This is the last panel of the afternoon. It's really happy and honored to be joined by Chicago's Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. To talk about technology and politics. <laughs> Starting off with the former. <laughs> Not exactly in that order. We'll start with the former. Uh, you're now in your second term, and Chicago has this major technology plan that you've been mm -hmm. implementing. But what's your, your big picture perspective on, on how you've grown as a mayor and, and understanding what technology could do for your city and, mm -hmm. and how you're going to pursue it as, and make it a central part of your agenda? Well, uh, it's part of an overall strategy for economic development and opportunity. And there are kind of building blocks that are part of that. Um, I'll give you two kind of illustrations of what we're trying to do in the city of Chicago as it relates uh, to, te or three, technology. By 2018, uh, you're not going to be able to graduate high school in the city of Chicago if you haven't taken c computer code writing. And uh, we're on course to achieve that goal and have that possible. You know, in the last 30 years, dual language was referred to as English and Spanish. Computer code writing is now the dual language. You have to know it. And so we're going to go from computer science being the class to the capacity where computer code uh, writing class is a graduation requirement in the city of Chicago from high school, which I'm proud to say last week we announced we hit it 70% of our kids are just shy, 69.9% uh, graduating. And our freshman on track is to 85%. And just to give you guys a sense of that, uh, four years ago it was 57%. So that's uh, a big piece of it. Second is we have uh, uh, 80 neighborhood libraries throughout the city of Chicago. We have as many libraries as uh, uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan combined. Uh, not that I'm competitive, but Chicago's libraries, uh, I am a middle child. Uh, <laughs> Chicago's libraries were rated number one in the United States, number three worldwide. Uh, every library has a teacher, and I don't get credit for this idea. This was actually the woman implementing it. Uh, but every uh, library, we now put uh, a teacher in a library between the hours of 2 and 6 for homework help. The woman in the library office that was responsible for it knows about a service. So we now provide free online tutoring in both English and Spanish from any computer you want, your library card, which is free. Your number on there is your passport, and or password. And from kindergarten to calculus, in any subject. Now remember, in Chicago, we have 140 languages spoken in our public schools. So if you're writing a paper on 1812, some people's parents can help you and some people's parents can't. Truth is, my evaluation was, I can help my kids on history. You got math problems, call your uncle. But the fact is, I want to make sure every child has access to support. So literally, home, library, any computer you want, you type your card and you get live chat, computer help, uh, homework help, for, uh, free of charge in the Chicago Public Libraries. And we now have out an RFP uh, is uh, to do the broadband uh, uh, challenge we have in the city of Chicago. So every neighborhood will have the economic opportunity both to succeed economically and have the kind of quality of life that we deal with the digital divide. In addition, in our schools, where Comcast has been extremely helpful, I know, I think I, David just talked about it. We use uh, the 89% uh, of our kids have some nutritional support. So we use that data and we drive a, uh, a very aggressive policy. You get 10 bucks a month, major discount, top flight uh, connectivity, and a voucher uh, for buying a computer for the home, like worth $200. Uh, Chicago leads in the effort. I think we're north of 27,000 families over the four years. So all these are pieces of an overall strategy of making technology access ubiquitous throughout the city, which I think is essential, and then having the skills to do that. You've mentioned Comcast and the importance of public-private partnerships. But when it comes to funding such a, a large strategy, how much of that is reliant on the, the private partnerships, and how much of it comes from maybe having to get new taxes or find new revenue streams to keep that kind of strategy sustainable? I wish we were doing this interview about a week from now, because we'll be making an announcement where the public sector, uh, we won a big grant, and we're going to finish a big project for the city. The private sector is important, but you got to, you know, the truth is the libraries, we did that on our, what, what I just mentioned on our own. I'll give you an example where the private sector has stepped up 
uh, our Chicago, uh, Chicago is the second largest community college system in the country. And I took each school of the seven, it's 115,000 students. Each school has an industry focus. Malcolm X, healthcare. They have 10, 15 companies on the board. They do the alum, they do all the curriculum, et cetera. Tr Olive Harvey, transportation, distribution, logistics. Harold Washington, professional services. Wright, IT. We have 150 companies doing the curriculum, the training of the teachers to train to the fastest growing fields in the city of Chicago. And in we, now the truth is, well, you know, Richard J. Daly, advanced manufacturing. Technology goes, you can't do healthcare without technology. You can't do transportation, distribution, logistics without technology. You can't do advanced manufacturing without technology. So the Motorola and other companies play a major role in bringing technology into the curriculum at our community colleges. That's not a tax or stuff, but it is tapping the private sector to play a central role. The good news is that um, the World Bank just noted that the community college system in Chicago, this is about two years ago, single best college career program in America. And what I'm very proud about last year, we announced implementing it this year. If you get a B average in our public high schools, community college is free. And it's open to everybody. So I don't care if your parents are from Mexico. I don't care, uh, I don't care if you don't have parents. Uh, there are days I wish I don't have kids. Uh, but we make it open to everybody. You have to earn, you're laughing too hard. Uh, you have to earn a B average. You earn a B average, we make community college free. And we just announced seven universities in the city of Chicago that if you now maintain your B average, you're automatically enrolled at UIC, automatically enrolled in DePaul, automatically enrolled in Roosevelt, and they will give you a discount on tuition. So we have a strategy for post high school education in the city of Chicago. What about your strategy when it comes to Chicago? It's been called the startup city, and when you're competing to draw these uh, ca venture capital firms and, and technology firms to Chicago, mm -hmm. I know you're going to sell it hard. But are there any challenges right now in that sh that, that that space for you in, in attracting the, that that money, that capital? Uh, you know, I forgot to say this, and this is not to give co individual companies a shout out. We got, Google agreed to put robots for code writing at our elementary schools in our libraries. And since we couldn't do it at every school, so 10 libraries can get the robots at that library checked out at their school. So we do, it's a way of us getting computer code writing into all the elementary schools, but we didn't have the capacity financially to get it to every school. And you're telling Google right from the start when they're coming to Chicago? Here's what I need you to do. Okay. This is your philanthropy, your help. Um, the biggest, uh, here's what we've done. Uh, unfortunately, you don't know the map of the city, but Merchandise Mart is right over the river in the downtown area. It's now what used to be owned by the Kennedy family, still owned, but is, or, uh, has an investment. It used to be housewares. It is all tech. Motorola Solutions, Motorola is there. 1871, our number one uh, startup uh, 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 innovation space is there. Uh, and a lot of technology uh, companies are all now every floor. You go north of that along the river and you go to Groupon in the old Montgomery Ward. And if you go west of the river is uh, where Google is now putting their new uh, center 1,200 employees. That triangle has now got 40,000, um, uh, 45,000 digital jobs. That's, those, that triangle is about a mile in a uh, area. And um, we, along the river, so we created kind of a geographic space um, with a platform for the community to kind of live by and work by. It's not an accident, it happens to be there. Where did we put our first protected bike lane on Kinsey? Right there. And that's not an accident, that's where technology took off. So a public investment on the infrastructure made a big deal. And we had, five years ago, we had zero innovation spaces. Now we have 11 of them. We just opened our first one just in the biomedical space. And it's made, it created a real platform for the city of Chicago. And just yesterday, by way of example, while Cleversafe is a data mining company, they were just bought by IBM for uh, north of a billion dollars. And that's, you know, PayPal that started in Chicago, moved west coast three years ago, bought Braintree in Chicago, an online payment system for about a billion dollars and not only kept the company there, but added 300 jobs. And so it's a testament to 
we're in a different space as it relates to capacity. Now, I tell every company, tech company that's coming to Chicago, I want you to give internships to kids in the Chicago public schools. You have got to get these kids in here access to what we're doing, or what you're doing. You've served as President Obama's chief of staff, member of the House. Yeah. You've often spoken of digital infrastructure in Chicago as a really important. What, what, what needs to happen nationally from your perspective, running a major American city in terms of digital infrastructure when you think about that as a theme for the country? Well, um, there's two parts. This is, not, this is human infrastructure, not the physical one. I think that's what you meant. All right. I think we should just make computer code uh, writing a graduation requirement. Nationally. Nationally. Just make it a requirement. You know, I'm, fi I'm fine with Common Core. We adopted it in the city, one of the first cities to do it. I'm great, great. You need this skill. National policy. Make it a high school graduation requirement. You'd be amazed if you make the goal, how much all the other choices will be made to get to that goal. You want to set 2020 as a goal? Great. You want to set, and we did it by 2018. Just make it a goal. A national priority, it's a national priority. It's not, this is not a volunteer activity. You know, I have to call my kids to turn on the TV. There's too many remote controls. I know you're handing one back there, that's why I said it. Uh, but you know, they need to know this now in a way that I can kind of get, get by kind of being okay by it. They can't. And so set a goal. That's what, the, that's what we're gonna do by 2018, 2019. And make it a requirement. On the physical piece, um, you know, I gotta be honest, the E-rate which I know sometimes the telecoms were opposed to, has worked. It has worked. And we got, well, that makes three people support me. We're all going to lunch after this. Uh, you know, I mean, it's worked, and we got to be honest. Uh, now, I will also be honest with you. Uh, there has to be some monitoring and accountability to its implementation. And I will tell you, local governments and others have been probably sloppy. And I can tell you that. On the other hand, at a macro level, very successful. And you couldn't get schools and libraries. Our school libraries are fully wired now, and our schools are almost there because of the E-rate. Okay, it's not just the hardware. And uh, schools and libraries, these public spaces, are where you bring people of all income, races, and backgrounds to share a common place again. And that's essential as a value uh, goal. So those would be the kind of, you know, I would, I'm, I'm getting on a plane after this. What do I care? I can't get killed here. But so, you know, I would just expand the E-rate and make it a bigger fee and set another goal. It's already built in. Do it that. But that means, you know, that thing down the road has to get its act together called the United States House of Representatives. And so that's hard. If you indulge, just a trio of political questions. Uh, one. No. Please. <laughs> well, we're going to try. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, a lot of your friends have told me that you once dreamed of being Speaker of the House. At least once was a dream. Uh, it, it turned into a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so, one, what's your impression of Kevin McCarthy, the majority leader, likely the next Speaker of the House? And what do you make of the whole scene in the House GOP with the Speaker leaving, with Boehner? I mean, you're a House, former House guy. What's your impression of it all? Well, first of all, um, uh, soon to be, I mean, uh, Speaker McCarthy and I didn't serve that long together. And uh, when I was chief of staff, we didn't really have a lot of interaction. So I'm not going to make a judgment of that, and I wish him well. Uh, that's all I would say to that. I think um, there's a history. I don't know if it's been written, but in 1994, the Republicans uh, took the majority of the House. And by 98, Newt Gingrich was ousted as speaker by their leadership. In 2010, the Republicans took back control of the House. And by 2015, John Boehner, ousted or not, is leaving. There's a reason both of those incidents have happened for different purposes, but um, I, I really shouldn't do this. Uh, you can draw whatever conclusion you want, but in both instances, the party has turned on itself. And I'm going to avoid a headline. I'm going to shut my mouth. You have no... No explanation for why that is. I mean, you're a, you're a political guy. I know, but this may require looking into the deep. By, uh, no, I'm not going to do on, it. The deep what? Um, the deep what? Just finish that sentence. No, look, they have. Let me. They have some issues as a party they need to work through, that maybe Blue Cross Blue Shield can help them with. 
But let me say one thing that actually, that's an intro. Let me take this somewhere else if I can <laughs> to avoid being a, creating my own problem. So anyway, you have two, both speakers when the party took over were ousted in an internal um, disagreement about the ideological political direction of their party where it wasn't anything else but their party taking down their leader. And there's a testament and there's a narrative there that they have to deal with uh, at both instances where aspiration and at goals and capacity didn't match up, but it was also ideal. It was more than that. It was also ideology. So just to f finish up on that, you think see as an internal Republican or roiling fight with? Well, it's not an external one. Well, but, so do you think it could change the dynamic for 2016 in House races or anything like that, or probably not? Be just being realistic. Well, you have a bigger problem. No, I think you have a bigger yes and no. You have a bigger problem here's which is beyond the Republican Party. And I say this as somebody who used to practice these dark arts. I've said this before, so it's not new. <laughs> Uh, well, look, our political system is set up for uh, people, the voters, to pick their elected leaders. Because of technology and redistricting, elected leaders are now picking their voters. It's turned the system upside down and inside out. That's what's happened. And all, to you, all you goo goo people that like good government, once you, t I reformed earmarks. I've said I do only public thing and here's what I'm gonna ask for and I put it on the website. Notice that once you took earmarks out of the system, how much has legislation gotten done? To bring back earmarks? Well, I'm just, uh, no, but I think, well, I mean, that's not what I'm advocating. Say there's not, you know, Lyndon Johnson, help, help Roosevelt. Them, it's not just Grease Skids, but yes, Grease Skids. Ling Lyndon Johnson, Franklin Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, y'all, people you admire for their political capacity, they, we're able to get the political system working. Right. Now, you take earmarks out, there should be a reform of the system, but you have taken out the ability of a leadership when parties are going to the extremes of the ability to work. So you got your good government. How's it working for you? All you goo-goos from Harvard and everybody else studying all this stuff, <laughs> you have basically broken the system in bringing good government. Now that said, that's not the problem. There's a bigger problem in my view, which is true in the United States, which is true this is not a discussion of digital divide, okay? Uh, so, uh, but, let me, uh, but here's the thing, never mind. Okay, uh, tur turning to Secretary Clinton's campaign, you're a supporter of hers. Uh, she is having some struggles, at least some polling. What's your, to, can, what, what, what does she need to do to get some more fire in her campaign and perhaps in the first debate? I, I know you're, you're uh, expanding you know, this, was, but well, you're- I, I was brought here under false premises. <laughs> These are, these are just a couple I feel hijacked me. now. No, you shouldn't feel hijacked. Okay. You, yeah, you, 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 don't to, wanna, you don't want to weigh in on Secretary Clinton at all? No, the, here's the, what I'm the, the first debate's next week. You're the mayor of Chicago. I thought, why not? Let me just say this. If I'm going to weigh in, and I'm going to weigh in on behalf of the city of Chicago and the children of the city of Chicago, I came here. I'll talk about politics. I love politics because I'm interested in it, and it's a way I, you can actually get goals done. Let me say this to all of you, and then I'll switch to politics. What Do not get... Uh, the digital issues and technology are important. They don't replace those doing some, they're part of an overall strategy. And so I say to you, you know, iPads don't replace teachers. They help you on individual learning, okay? Uh, they help kids who are in a class who are going at different levels to do individual learning, but technology doesn't replace a really great motivating teacher, never will. Can they supplement? Can they support? Yes. Can they replace? Not a chance. Can you help through technology? You know, in this way with David Cohn and Comcast that have been unbelievably helpful. It's one thing to get a computer in a room. It's one thing to get a connectivity. But if you don't have the classes and the skill development to go with that, it's a piece of furniture that in about a year will be outdated. And so what I say to all of you that are clearly here because you're interested in this topic, Getting an iPad to a class, getting a computer to a home that's not wired, or if it's wired, that then doesn't have the skill set or the training around with it, is a computer in a house that's wired. That's all it is. And so I appreciate the passion. We're trying to pursue this uh, in the city in fits and starts. Some things we're doing well, some we're not. But don't think that that is the end. It is a means towards a larger goal where everybody then has a capacity 
to participate in an economy and a society where technology plays a central role, but it is not the role. That's my spiel, and I'm, that's it. We appreciate it. So I'll just end on one fun note as someone who covers Republican politics. I, I was, my brother lives in Chicago. I know. Okay. And, How's uh, it working for you? It's, it's a fun beat. <laughs> so I was in Chicago, and the first thing, we were, at the, were along the river, and you see the big Trump Tower in Chicago. So as mayor, do you have a relationship with Trump, and what do you make of his campaign? <laughs> the tower is in Chicago. It's a city issue. Yeah, but let me say this. As I said then, and I'll say this. First of all, the, the agreement to put the sign there was in a planned development agreement before my tenure. The building is really beautiful. That's a word he often uses, beautiful. The building is. I can't say a lot about the sign, but the building is unbelievable. It's a Skidmore Owings building, and all of you are invited back to come along our new river walk in the city of Chicago as we open up a second waterfront in the city. So your relationship uh, is purely real estate and... and well, it's, it's there. So let me say one thing, if you, since you want to talk either Hillary or Trump. Uh, but I'll just, we just brought it up at the end, but anyway. All right, it's a, I'll close on this point, which is a larger point, because both parties' primaries now reflect this. You have in the country huge angst against both the political elite and the economic elite of this country. You have three people in the Republican primary who never held office leading the ticket, reflecting people's anger at the political insiders. You have, not that, he, not that Ber, Ber, Bernie Schwartz is leading, but he is farther along as a socialist in the Democratic primary, reflecting people's angst about the economy. You can describe everything you want. The fact that the middle class in the last 12 years have not gotten a raise and their standard of living has been reduced, even post a recession, is a testament to where our politics is today, and both parties' primaries for president reflect that fundamental angst. It's also happening in the Europe, and until we deal with the challenges the middle class are facing to their standard of living, and a political system that is not responding in any capacity, coordinated uh, way, you're gonna to continue to have dysfunctional politics. Our politics reflect something larger. They're not dysfunctional on their own. Mayor Manuel, thanks so much for your time, appreciate sure. it.